Ladies and gentlemen, boys, girls, and all you savvy minds out there, I hope you're ready to rumble because this is Campus Debates. <laughs> On this show, we have three strong pillars that guide us. We're all about debunking myths, unpacking the unknown, but most importantly, unlocking the power of conversation. It is a place where young people take center stage and boldly shake up the status quo in a bid to influence the world around them. We hope to shape narratives. We hope to change this uh, narratives that society has been built on for us and for future generations. My name is Ivy Musundi. I am a seasoned debater, but for tonight, I am your host. <laughs> In tonight's debate, I am joined by two very strong teams, again, from two prestigious institutions. On side proposition, we have the team of Zachary Mbeke and John Mwendwa from Kenyatta University. A little more energy, guys. And on side opposition, we have the team of George Kiritu and Randy Mugambi from the Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology. <laughs> People of Juja, I hope you feel represented because tonight we are having you on the show. I'll start with opposition this time. What's with the hair, guys? What's going on? <laughs> what was it team you decided as a team, Mama? Randy, let's start with you. What's the inspiration behind your hair? Trying to represent the African woman. <laughs> I think it's more or less about confidence in yourself, confidence in understanding how you look like, what makes you look good, what makes you feel good. And that's what we try to bring to today's debate. The hair is Randy's crowning glory. Ooh. George, yeah. what's, what's, what your partner didn't inspire you to... <laughs> Well, personally, I hate blow dries, but um, I like my hair in wash and goes. It makes me feel more African and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> I think we get the theme. Young people nowadays are all about feeling confident about themselves so that they're able to go head to head against those who have been the structures upon which we were built. Um, Zach. Yes. Say, say something to the people. Who do you think is watching you tonight? I want to tell everyone watching us tonight that during the first session up to now, there's no one winning from the OG. I'm the first person to do so tonight. <laughs> Keep watching. Let me explain. Zachary has just said most of the teams that have been winning here are opposition teams. He's going to be the first government team to win the debate tonight. <laughs> The bar has been set high. Mwendo, is that how you are feeling? Yes. Say something. So say yes. <laughs> you don't feel confident? Yeah, we are How confident. Many <laughs> oh, we are confident. Amazing. That being said, we are joined by an incredible panel of judges chaired by the very lovely Miss Abigail Wairimo. <laughs> Miss Abigail is a graduate of Strathmore University. We are still honored to have her. She is joined by Miss Becky Alec, who is a student at Strathmore University. And Mr. Joshua Wambugu, a student at the Uni uh, United States International University, Africa. From going forward, we will be shortening the names of these schools because they are very long. Now we are taking three seconds to just say United States International. Anyway, um, we are happy to have you. Um, Miss Becky, what are your expectations for this debate tonight? I think I just expect us to have a wonderful discussion. Um, I'm trying to not expect too much, but also not to walk in blind. 
uh, let's just have reasonable discourse and hopefully be intentional with your arguments. All the best. Miss, Miss Be Becky, I'm say my expectations zibaki zero. Expectations remain at zero so that you don't get disappointed. Anyway, we hope for a lovely debate, just like she said. We hope to have positive feedback, which is one of the goals of this show. It is to show that as young people, we're interested in participating in matters policy and matters administration and matters that involve us even going forward in terms of governance and all the things that benefit us and creating discourse around these issues. That being said, the motion for today is a motion that, you know, touches us as young people because we are hoping to go into the employment sector and we are hoping to get employed to hopefully employ ourselves and employ others, create employment among all these things. The motion for today reads, this house would prohibit companies from regulating the private affairs of their employees in the contract. We're talking about things to do like with mandatory drug tests, and you know the basic things that are involved in a contract that involve the active um the private lives of employees that is what we'll be discussing tonight a twitter poll has been placed up tell us what you think whether you support the motion or whether you're against the motion vote also uh, remember to engage with us uh, our sms line is 22151 tell us what you think about the motion tell us which side you think is going to win this round with that being said we welcome the first proposer to begin for us this debate here here Madam Chair, we think that a person who walks into a job field who is 18 years and above, who is also have some skills, is a, some, someone who is already sane and know what to do. They know at what time to control their marriage and job place. They know at what time to control how, where to take their drugs and at what time they are supposed to really admit to what they should be doing in the office. What this debate is not about, this debate is not about morals. This one I'm telling to Randy specifically so that it doesn't run the case of morals in this debate, right? Because two things. One, what is moral to Randy is not moral to me. But again, secondly, what company requires is work output, not if you are moral or not moral, right? But to some extent, panel, for you to know that OG is winning this debate, right? If the huge case lies on the reputation of the company, I'm going to handle that in my first three framings in this debate. To the first framing panel, companies always have work ethic to be followed within the workplace, which allows workers to then follow them within that particular workplace, right? Apart from that particular workplace, where you have your private life, then it means that you are no longer a property of a company, but you are a property of your own individual right, right? You will be given that autonomy to control what you do, to know what you are doing, to control what you take, and also for you to have that energy to perform these particular companies, right? But again, secondly, for these companies, therefore, to have maximum utilization from their employers, then these people should be given a free environment to express their will to perform better and again to be given all the opportunities to ensure that they're not being treated as slaves, right? In the, their world, they think that now that I'm being employed by maybe Safaricom or I'm being employed by maybe Kenyatta University, then I'm their slave, right? We think that employment is not about slave, but employment is me giving services to my employer and then employer treating me as human being, treating me as a person who is adult, treating me as a person who is sane in this particular debate, right? What this therefore takes out for this their case is this. This already shut down any argument from opposition like drinking in work or lacking concentration in the place of work, right? I don't say that we should not drink. Drinking in work is, 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 is a work ethic. You should not drink in work. If they want to argue in such particular premises, they are out in this debate, right? Or lack of concentration because you're using WhatsApp, you're using phones in the office. Those ones are work ethics that everyone knows, everyone follows them, right? The debate is not about the place of work. The debate is about your private life, right? That To, to that particular extent, I think they are very, getting that clearly, right? But I guess second type of framing, which is very important, as we start this debate so that Randy can be with me on the same page, right? Companies are always defined with things that happens within each premises. For example, if I work within Kentucky University, then I take drugs as customers looking at me. That is when that is when they define that companies as a drug load area, right? But if I take my drugs at equivalent, part away from Kentucky University, that is my individual, right? That is my individual personality. It does not 
being directed directly to Kenya University, right? But why do we have people like if you take drugs maybe in Kivalot, they still direct you to Kenya University because companies will already give this self responsibility to themselves through this kind of policies. As long as they have these policies, then it means, it means that the workers that are in Beke taking alcohol in Kivalot will still be directed to them because they already impose that responsibility to themselves. It means that if you free this, then you free companies from following, from giving them better, better responsibility of following their workers as if they are kids, as if their people require these particular responsibilities among them trade, right? What therefore they need to prove is that with this, what therefore companies should be given this greater responsibility of following Zachary Mbeke, even his place of work, even who Zachary dates, with this that particular accent is already important because of two things. One, it's already shut down the argument of opposition that this will destroy their reputation if they don't follow it up, right? I tell you that if they stop following up, then they reduce that their burden of no water touching these particular workers to the companies. It means that if you do my things in equivalent, the reputation of Kenyatta University still remains the reputation of Kenyatta universities. I don't say anything that if me, I'm, I'm, today I'm maybe dating Becky, how that will affect Kenyatta University in itself, right? Within, if that is the argument of reputation and etc., then they already fought in this debate. But to the much more important thing, what is the burden of opposition so that they come here and run their case? But first, let me take a simple vote, a POI. So, do you know who Jeffrey Epstein is? I think that is not a required POI here, if I know someone or not. <laughs> what is very important here, as much as I prove to him that they don't have responsibility to control that person in his place of work, I think that is what my responsibility is, right? But to the burden, what is the burden of opposition? They need them to justify why companies should control my personal life, even if it doesn't directly attached to them, right? Because it's, it's, me as an individual, I have my own right, I have an autonomy to make my own decision, I have to live my life, and I also have to be happy, I should not be controlled all the time, I have to be given free space to think, to have mental stability, and also to inter like also to have that my social life different from the company's life, right? As much as they cannot justify that, we think that these people will be the fourth in this particular debate, right? Thank you. <laughs> they will run the we we'll get it. So, go we'll get this. We thank that speaker for that fine speech. It is important for me to note that all names that are named here are specifically for example purposes to give intuition to the argument that the speaker is making. That being said, we welcome the first opposer to begin for us this debate. Here, here. Here, here. So, before I begin, obviously we're the hair gurus, so we're not exactly the best suited for opposition. So disclaimer, these do not exactly reflect uh, my views personally. So I will start in three, two, one. We find a glaring contradiction provided by government side when they come and tell us that, you know, um, first they come and tell us that productivity doesn't matter as long as the individual desires are guaranteed. Then they come in and give an example of if somebody drinks at the workplace and that affects their productivity, then that itself is, 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 is it doesn't matter as long as the individual desires are met. But then they set the criteria or the metric that as long as you can show productivity is actually um, existing in a workplace, then the opposition side will carry the day. Well, by their own metric, we have carried the day. So I will continue. So first, um, the issue that they come in and talk about morals are individually subjective. We're not here to actually talk about sub individual morals. Do c companies do not uh, respond to the morals of individuals. They respond to the morals of a society in general. Why? Because it is the society that they target their profits. It is the society that they want to actually maintain goodwill with. Therefore, in order for a company to maintain their profits, in order for a company to maintain their good reputation with the larger society, they have to conform what societal, to what societal um, expectations are, what societal demands are. So, People don't usually want to buy from companies that are full of drug addicts. People do not want to buy buy things from companies um, that have that that have uh, that promote such in lewd lifestyles. So that is an issue that they try to confuse. But we hope we've provided clarity on that. But. More importantly, I think we also have to point out that perception is not just important for the company, but it, it's important for the individual as well. Because if you do something that hurts companies, a company's reputation, and the company goes down, then you are out of a job. 
So that means that the kind of guarantees that you secured for yourself are gone. Therefore, this is not just important for the company, it's important for the employees. Now, next, I'd just like to point out that some of the things that are being pointed out here are actually beneficial. Mandatory drug tests. Remember, a company, most companies are liable for your health insurance. Therefore, if they don't actually take active measures to see that you're preventing them from actually taking on all of these burdens and whatnot, then if there are no mandatory drug tests and you like to drink and you become an alcoholic and then you stop becoming a functioning alcoholic and you become an unfunctioning alcoholic, then that means that the cost of rehabilitation is going to be on the employer themselves. So, same same with, for example, let's even talk about um, 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 prohibiting them from dating, right? We remember one of the beneficial things to talk about here is the power imbalances that are usually seen from um, superiors and inferiors, right? We know that there are coercive measures that superior, superior, su superior, those who are holding superior offices in a company can take uh, against, the in, uh, against the inferiors, right? You can come and say that if you want that promotion, you have to do something for me. I won't mention the things. But the fact that that exists means that if you can prohibit dating or any other sort of interactions from taking place in a company is actually a net good, especially, for example, for the women in that company who are going to be the most vulnerable to these kinds of coercive measures. Now, next, I'd just like to talk about... Um, um, work environment. Again, I'd just like to point out that, again, by their metric, if we can prove productivity, then that is good. So, if you do not have distractions in terms of dating, if you do not do drugs, and if you're not constantly on social media, that means that you're going to be performing well on, 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 on the job, right? That means that your productivity is up. That means company profits are up. That means that the bonuses that you're going to get are also going to go up. So, at the end of the day, you're able to guarantee yourself your own livelihood. But, if if we decide, oh, I'm a free spirit, I want to do whatever it is that I want to do, then that means that productivity is going to go down. A company only functions insofar as people can work together. Individuality is not the thing that's supposed to be prioritized in a company. Otherwise, it would fall apart and you'd have everybody just wanting to make decisions for themselves. That is not how we want to run things. Now, um, I'd just like to point out, again, um, I'd just like to point out, um, okay, so... For example, um, re regulating employees, um, the, your employees' social media. We know full well that cancel culture is a thing currently, right? We know full well that um, people sometimes have to watch themselves, be politically correct in whatever it is that they're talking about. And that is not that not only has implications for the company, that is if you say something, but it also has implications for the individual. Because remember, if you go out there and say something and the company wants to dissociate itself from that, they'll just drop you, they'll just fire you, right? So the company is actually looking out for your best interests. And that is something that government side does not want to recognize. Before I continue, is there a POI? Oh, time is up, sorry. So, um, yeah, so you come in and talk about you turn 18 and you're saying, I mean, we can all remember ourselves at 18 years. Do you seriously think that your 18 years were like times when you were making the most rational of decisions? Anyway, um, my partner will come in and talk about things like uh, pregnancy and how that is going to benefit the company and other such kind of uh, points that I have failed to mechanize on. Thank you so much. <laughs> We thank that speaker for that fine speech. At this point, we need a break. But then I'll pose this question to you. Do you think the company that you work for should be regulating your social media? Do you think mandatory drug tests are something that improve on your productivity or they just infringe on your personal um, life? As we go on this short break, remember to keep engaging with us. We'll be right back. Good evening and welcome back. This is Campus Debates with me, Ivy Musundi, and tonight we're discussing the motion this house would prohibit companies 
from regulating the private behaviors of their employees. We're talking about things like mandatory drug tests, regulating their social media, and having you as an employee having to declare your spouse or your relationship even at the workplace. With this, we welcome the second proposer to continue for us this debate. Here, here. Yeah, yeah. Starting my speech in three, two, one. So first things first, I want to push some burdens to side opening opposition, right? Because we argue from opening government that employees are sane people and are mature people and they know what to do and not what to do and what affects their productivity and what does not affect their productivity. They follow up ethics and so forth. People are not stupid. You get that from my first speaker. The burden I want to push on opening opposition is this. If if like you are able to do things such as regulate their dating life, mandatory drug test, then the question becomes where does that stop? Because realize it's not only like dating life or like drug tests that necessarily affect what the productivity an employee has during working hours. So doing something like staying up too late and watching too much television can also affect my productivity during the workplace. If you are willing to, for example, push and regulate my dating life, are you also going to give me a bedtime that I should sleep at, say, 9 or 8? Because then that becomes the burden on your side. Secondly, realize employees are extremely vulnerable to the employers because like one jobs are extremely scarce and two like the employees just have so much power over them in as much as they control their salaries and so forth which means they don't have like a, a lot of bargaining power when they interact with their employers meaning this is something that is very possible in your world where there is no limit or there isn't a red line to what companies can do in regards to employees as to what they can impose on their private lives and to feel that is extremely detrimental but secondly we, we pose it to you that this these employees are saying people are mature people and they know what to do and not what to do. If opening opposition denies that burden and says a person is sane enough or mature enough to know that you should not watch television to 12 because you have work tomorrow, then they should also agree that a person is sane enough or mature enough to know you should not drink alcohol and have a mob on Monday when you go to work. So then to choose your poison or rather pick your poison. The second thing I want to the second thing I want to posit is on what my member talked about and I want to like elaborate it more and why it is important. That is how your private life provides an escape from like your the, your work life. One, work is hard, right? You work around eight to nine hours a day. You probably have to get like get up very early in the morning and so forth. Two, work can be toxic, right? You can have a very terrible boss or like terrible working conditions in general, or maybe you just don't like the people you work with, right? You feel like then you are extremely limited in what you can do in your workplace and like what you can really engage with because like the workplace has, has like so much power over you and so forth. Your private life is where you unwind and is where you relax. If the company is allowed to interfere with you do even to the extent of your private life even without your like outside your working hours it means then you lose the safe space that you as an individual has to unwind and relax from all the stress that you accumulate within the day because of the workplace this means you never feel relaxed this means you never unwind and this means generally you lack the energy to face tomorrow and like face the challenges that come with your workplace this means you are less likely to work optimally on their side and you are less likely to produce your level best when it comes to the workplace and you are less likely to perform best for your work the impact of this is that if you can't perform optimally, it means you are making losses for your company. If you are making losses for your company, because this is a company that works on profits, this is a capitalistic system, right? It means then you are much likely to like lose your job. It means you are much likely to get unemployed. But also on like a second impact, if you can't have a safe space, if you can't unwind and just relax generally in your private life, it means you are more likely to face things such as depression and anxiety because necessarily you are slave to these people and to the don't have like a place of your own that you can really identify with meaning you affect this individual personally but also you affect how they like uh, produce how they are able to like work and produce optimally thirdly and like uh, George brings this up and I think my partner deal is this is the only issues that uh, um, companies have like there's a social there's a like societal limelight on companies and as it is they should work realize my partner tells you it is 
is very easy for a company to come and to differentiate themselves from their employees and say that was just a bad apple. That does not represent the company's values or what we stand for. It is very easy if somebody does something extreme to like just fire them and say, look, we don't associate with this person. This is not what this company stands for. At the moment in time where you impose this kind of policies on them, it then brings the mindset to the people that those employees act that certain way or pro portray those behaviors because of the rules that you have set on them, meaning you are directly responsible to how they are acting because they are acting following the rules that you set for them, which then bring which then like brings the burden on the companies that your employees are acting this way because you set these rules for them. Your employees are acting this way because you wanted them to act this way. This makes it harder for the companies to differentiate themselves from the employees. It makes it easier for people to actively attack these companies and associate them with bad behaviors or behaviors that are not like accepted within society. Proud to propose. We thank that speaker for that fine speech. We now welcome the last member of this debate to close for us this debate. Hear, hear. Hear, hear. Chair and the judicators, there are three concessions that we need to make into today's debate. One, they come and run a case where we are trying to portray, to portray a world in which companies control everything that you do within your life, even the time in which you sleep, even the time in which you sleep. Basically, you're going back to the same, same high school life in which you came back, in which you came out of. Three concessions. One, even if they come and run the case that one, you are a slave, you are still getting money out of that. Very important. Before the company, remember, you had nothing. Two, you applied for that job. Three, you actually have an opt-out in that you applied for that job. You feel like that is too much, get out. You can resign. You can go back to that jobless life where you actually weren't providing for yourself. Remember, at the point where you're able to provide for yourself even a dollar a day, you're much better than more than 65% of the world's population right now. So they want to run a case where we, are, where we are actually protecting our assets and kind of limiting your life. Yes, we're limiting your life, but we are also paying you for limiting your life. At the point where they don't even engage with that, then they rank out of this debate. Second concession panel, we think that the impact of limiting your life in some sense as they run into this debate, in that it, it provides more sustainability for a lot of people, and I'll be engaging with that far much later in, in my speech. Three panel, we think that companies don't particularly care about your perception of life and your perception of morals. They care about what's important to them, and if your perception of morality does not particularly buy into protecting their assets, because again, the companies are the most vulnerable actors in today's debate, at the point where you as an actor in that debate don't particularly buy into protecting their own assets and providing maximal, maximal profits to these companies, then to that extent, you don't even you don't even deserve to be anywhere in this in this debate. At the point where you under where you where you understand or rather your value system is particularly say tuned towards maybe what you consider to be happy and maybe not what these companies consider as happiness, what not what not these companies consider to be important, then to that extent, chair, you don't really understand what is really going on in today's debate. Now we think that what are the disadvantages of employees being particularly allowed to, to portray themselves in social media however, however which way they want? We think that we've seen this more than a number of times in that, one, employees may have an, a certain bad opinion that might not be particularly true to these companies. And we think that this may be a bad thing for a company in two forms. One, we think that companies are meant to protect two things. They are quarterly reporting requirements to the, to the people who own the stocks to those companies. But secondly, scrutiny from investors and people who want to short your stock. Because again, you are a company, your biggest incentive is monopolization. There's always going to be somebody who is against that promise. I'll take you in the next minute. We think that when people find out ab about bad comments that may not be actually particularly true, because again, there's no metric to prove that these, are, that these are actually true. We think that people are actually having a greater incentive to short your stock and drive you as a company to the ground without particularly caring about what you consider to be important to you as a company. And at the point where we prove to you that the company is the most vulnerable actor in today's debate, regardless of whether they tell you what their perception of happiness is, then they don't really protect what this company considers as important, and with that, they rank out of this debate. Secondly, we think that standards for employees, as you were told by my partner, aren't approved. Or we think that the standards for employees, companies don't, won't really go for standards that aren't 
particularly accepted by societies. Things like drug tests. We think that companies employ people who don't employ people who aren't particularly perceived as acceptable by society for two reasons. One, they care about the market in which they sell their goods. At the point where you as an employee don't particularly protect this thing, very, this very thing that they consider to be very important in today's debate, then you hurt what the company considers as important. And with that case, we think that you don't really work towards what the company considers as important. And with that, you think that you don't even deserve a resignation nation you deserve to be fired but secondly we think that at the point where the company the company's greatest incentive is monopolization of the markets if you as an employee don't work towards that incentive of monopolization as a market and anything that you do the drugs that you take the amount of alcohol that you take Zachary the amount of alcohol that you might take in, in maybe today's debate or even beyond if it doesn't protect what the company considers as important then with that case we think that the company has even a greater incentive to fire you but finally we think that we even protect women who might who might even be caregivers in that one, we think that the conversation around the gender pay gap is important for two reasons. One, it protects the women in that one, we limit your dating life beyond a certain point in two forms. One, we protect your value for family in the society is still sustained, but secondly, beyond that age which the company decides to be fine, you can become a caregiver beyond this point. Since the company limited you, the company has a greater incentive to protect you and even give you much better um, maternity leave and even things towards things protecting around you as a caregiver and you as a mother. At the point where in, in status quo right now, most companies don't particularly care whether you are a mother whether you are, say, a caregiver, and they don't really give you anything towards that direction, we think that we have a greater incentive to even protect the mothers in today's society, so even reducing the conversation around the gender pay gap, proud to oppose. Thank you. We thank that speaker for that fine speech. That brings us to the close of this debate. But the question still stands. Do you think the company regulating your private life is good for you in that the company is able to protect you better? Or are they simply infringing on your right to privacy? Um, with that, I think we'll go on a short break. Remember to engage with us on our SMS line. It is 22151. It is free of charge. Tell us whether you agree with this motion or not. Also engage with our social media handles at KTN Home on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Of course, we put up a poll just like always. Tell us whether you, uh, you subscribe to this motion or you do not support it. Tell us which team you think is winning the debate, which we'll find out after this short break break stay tuned Welcome back, folks. This is Campus Debates, and we are entering the third leg of the show. Tonight, we were discussing whether your company should regulate your private um, endeavors and life as an employee. We're talking about things like mandatory drug tests and you having to disclose your spouse and basically regulating your social media handles. Does what, does what you do on social media reflect or regulate um, uh, reflect how your company is viewed are you as an employee a representative of your company even outside of office hours in your personal leisure time that is the question we were asking today send us an sms um, on 22151 it is free tell us what you think tell us which side of the motion you support and what uh, essentially are your thoughts on the matter right about now we are going into the segment where our panel asks uh, a question to either side of the debate to provide clarity and possibly sway them so participants how you answer this question is very key because it may or may not determine whether you win the debate you may be able to sway one judge who was not convinced so answer carefully i'll hand it over to miss chair to take us through 
Alright, so the general question will be answered by one member from each side. The question, or rather the debate, has seemed to fall on a question of morality and what counts as morality. Therefore, my question to you is, in the corporate space, should we still deem morality to be subjective or should there be a bare minimum standard of morality on which companies and corporations will hold their employees to? Thank you very much. I think this question directly matches with my first framing I did in this debate. I said that we are living in a very capitalistic world. Company doesn't care about the society morals. Companies are meant to make profits. What George can say about society morals is out of this debate. That matches that if, we, if you go with Jose's argument, then in conservative society, where we have, have an LGBTQ member who have skills, with this therefore company won't employ them because of such kind. They don't have much with society morality. So it means that they already locked them out of that particular debate. I was saying that. So morality, we have what you call work ethics. Work ethics everyone is born to follow. But the society morality is not the business for company. There are many businesses to make profit. Thank you. Chair, we think that morality, without even this question, is already objective in two forms. One, society already perceives morality as a specific form or as a specific figure in society. But secondly, this specific form changes with time. If we are able to find, say, a Zachary in his best case scenario, an LGBTQ member who is actually able to pro produce and work faster and much better than somebody who is actually, say, without even considering any gender specifics or anything like that, then we already achieve objectivity in that, one, productivity has already been seen. If the company can already sense objectivity from you or can already see objectivity from whatever you bring to that company, then they already take that. From their side of this motion, it's more or less subjective. But on our end, without even this question, it's already objective in that morality in society is dynamic. At the point where we are able to consider the, the dynamics in, of society and we're still able to incorporate them in the answers that, they, that this motion so, seeks to question, then at that point we are still able to prove to you that on our end, we still win this debate. Thank you. So this question goes to opposition. It's still your response to proposition on this one is still unclear and would like clarity as panel. Proposition, especially at second, tells you that if the government... If the company can dictate certain aspects of your life, then there isn't much deterring them from going overboard and you know, monitoring other aspects of your life, such as bedtime and that sort of discussion. Do you think then that there is, to some extent, um, a border that most companies cannot, say, go beyond? And what is the deterring factor that keeps them in check on what they can regulate and what they cannot? The answer that we give from side opposition is that consumer de demand is what provides the limiter. What we tell you is this, if a company demands that their employers work overnight, get little to no sleep, and that gets out to the public, the public reacts, company profits go down, the company is going to respond by reducing the by increasing uh, the leisurely time that a company has had. For example, we've seen that with Amazon, the kind of backlash that they've gotten from the mistreatment with the, of their workers and how they've been able to respond based on that. Based on that. So from, what, how, from our side, what we tell you is that that sort of check is provided by the consumer and consumer demands. Uh, my question is to side government or proposition. Based on your characterization, you told us that it's unjustifiable for a corporation to regulate the private lives of an individual because it's not intrinsically tied to their performance in the workplace. But let me give you an example and I want you guys to give me an answer to it. Let's say I'm an alcoholic, right? I'm an alcoholic, my reasoning is a bit flawed because of my addiction to alcohol. I drink before work, right? Then I come to work inebriated. Uh, let's say I work at a factory, I cause damage at a factory, I injure somebody. If the business then fires me for that action, isn't that then them holding me accountable or regulating my private life because I was drinking outside of the workplace? Uh, 
I think this question also was answered in my first framing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because there are things that I say that a person who is 18 years and above is already a same person. They know what to do at work and what not to do at work. It comes in and clearly defines to you that a person who is there for looking for a work and how em employers, employees are directly attached to employers being that job are less, they know very well that if they go to the job drunk, they, they, they destroy the work ethics, they will be fired. I've seen that. So they necessarily, they know the limit in which they go about it. I've seen that. There are people who are saying they know at what time to, to do it and at what time not to do it because it matches with the work ethics. That one, all of those came within my first framing of this debate. Thank you. That brings us to the end of this debate. We are now ready to hear from our panel. Hopefully the questions they asked and the answers that were provided were able to sway them if they hadn't already made their decision. Did they sway you at home? Did they sway you in the audience? Yes. Ideally, the only swaying that matters is those of the panel, so we are ready to hear from them. That being said, drum rolls, please. Well, unfortunately... Contrary to Zachary's very bold claim, yet again on campus debate, opposition has taken the win. <laughs> Let's give a round of applause for side opposition. All right, so our justifications for this is it was actually quite close. It was a 2-1 split. And the marginal win, we based it on the principal justification. The case that we get from opposition and the first thing that gave them an edge over government side is the fact that they were able to properly characterize the companies in this case as the vulnerable actors. Giving them the characterization of the vulnerable actors made us, as the panel, ask the question, then what in this case is in the best interest of the companies? What is in the best interest of the companies, as was rightly posed by the leader of opposition, is their net goals. Their net goals being maximizing profits. How do they maximize profits? They maximize profit by pleasing the consumer. The only way they can please the consumer is if they conform to the moral standards which they set in their characterization as the moral standards of the society. The point where government tilted and ended up ranking second is while we took the argument of privacy, and as the question was posed by, by panelists, to what extent should companies be allowed to infringe, they didn't show us the need for this privacy to be taken as a priority over the needs of, again, the vulnerable actor, the company. Then again, the opposition also told us even while they're infringing on their privacy, there is a win. They give you a salary. They give you benefits. We didn't get a concrete government for the government side that showed us why, even despite all the benefits, both to the vulnerable actor and to the person who's being in fridge, should we still take privacy as the winning argument? Let's give another round of applause for side opposition. You will hear the chief adjudicator, uh, adjudicator constantly mentioning government side. As per the British parliamentary system, ideally the side that brings um, the motion to the House is called the government side and the other side is called the opposition uh, side. That's why you'll hear speakers mention things like the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister. Those are just the speaking um, titles that are given to speakers in debates. I hope you enjoyed this debate. Thank you to the speakers who were able to, to make this um, debate interesting. Thank you to the lovely panel. Thank you to my audience here. You are a wonderful audience. And thank you to the audience at home as well for tuning in. A big appreciation to Strathmore University for allowing us to film um, this episode was filmed at Strathmore University. If you want us to come and film in your school next, reach out to us and we will be there. Otherwise, that is all. I am your host, Ivy Musundi, and this has been Campus Debates. Thank <laughs> you.